It's like they they're like housewife 1950s housewife dragons. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to be read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Corrine from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning, this podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Keep It Fictional from the Port Moody Public Library. Today is the Sadie and Virginia show because nobody else is here. Yeah, but it's going to be a great show because we are going to be talking about dragons. Well, like, okay, so the reason why the topic was chosen was because 2024 this year is the year of the dragon. So I thought we'll take advantage of it because not every single year works. Because I don't think we do like a, I don't know, books about roosters <laughs> or like books about snakes. It may not have the same ring to it as books about dragons or maybe not as many choices. So we thought that we'll take advantage of it and, and do an episode about uh, dragons. Now, before we start, Sadie, how do you feel about dragon books in general? If there's a book or movie or game that has like dragons in it, does it make you want to read it or watch it more? So when we first picked this topic, I, we were given an option and I immediately went to this one. I'm like, dragons, of course, dragons, of course, dragons. Why would I not pick dragons? But then I thought about it. I'm like, I don't actually enjoy dragon books all that much. <laughs> I read a lot of fantasy, so you would think that it kind of comes into it, but I I actually tend to avoid dragon books. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. I have nothing against dragons as a mythological creature. I have no issues with them, but I just don't enjoy reading about them quite as much. <laughs> what about you, Virginia? I'm exactly the same. Like, why do we pick this topic again? I don't know, but I'm exactly the same. In fact, if there's a book that has dragons in it, unless there's some other really compelling reason why I have to read it, I would generally avoid it. I won't. I just don't find them that exciting. Like, I know some people say, like, ooh, riding dragons. Well, I'm like, don't care. Great. We have two very, like, ambivalent <laughs> to us dragon, to us our topic for today. But hopefully, our books have good dragons in them. And that we like them. I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. Well, I'm going to go first. And there's a reason for that. Not just because I don't care about dragons. Because now that I know that, like, Sadie also don't really care for dragons. But I'm going to go first. So my book happens on April 25th in 1955. On this day, 642,987 women turn into dragons and flew away. They call this the mass dragoning events. And prior to this, there have been incidents where women transform into dragons, but you won't hear it on the news and you won't read it in the papers because they don't want you to know about them. All you will hear is a fire that has broken out and burned down a building, or a mysterious gas leak that has caused some sort of explosion, or a woman and sometimes her husband simply disappeared. But this time, there are simply too many witnesses. There's simply too many people who have seen dragons or know people or have lost their wives or their mothers or their sisters to this dragoning event. And you can't hide something like that. So what they decide to do is to try to make people forget. They try to make dragons into a taboo subject. In fact, many people can't even say the word dragon. Their face blush when they say it or when they hear the word or they immediately try to change the subject. Dragon is just not something you talk about in polite company. Alex was eight years old when the mass dragoning event happened. She remembered that morning her mom went out and her mom took her aside and said, I am coming back. Absolutely. Okay. I am definitely coming back, but I just need to go out for a bit. And her mom did. Her mom came back that evening, bringing Beatrice with her. Now, Beatrice is Alex's cousin and Alex adores Beatrice, this 
tiny toddler is her favorite human being. She loves her so, so, so much. And she, she was really excited to see Beatrice. But it's weird because Aunt Mala wasn't there. And so she asked, where's Aunt Mala? And her mom said, I don't know who you're talking about. Now take your sister upstairs. And Alex was like, that's Beatrice. She's not my sister. I said, take your sister upstairs. Beatrice has always been your sister. What are you talking about? And even as she was walking upstairs with Beatrice, all confused, she could see Beatrice is pointing to the door, pointing outside and say, Mama, Mama. And Alex's mom just said, Mama is right here. I'll be right with you. I just need to have a little bit of a rest. I've been out the whole day. And just like that, Aunt Mala has been erased from her family. She's never allowed to talk about Aunt Mala because according to her mom, according to her dad, Aunt Mala simply does not exist. Aunt Mala is gone. Aunt Mala, who used to be a fighter pilot, who is the best auto mechanic in the shop, Aunt Mala, who used to wear these giant brown boots, and that when she stands, her legs wide apart, it's like nothing can ever knock Aunt Mala down. And Aunt Mala, who used to give her a wink all the time, as if they're sharing some private joke. But now she's gone. She's no longer there. And it's just going to be Alex and Beatrice, her sister. Alex knows that Amala must have turned into a dragon and she has disappeared and flew away like many other women. This is When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnhill. I believe that's Kelly Barnhill's first adult novel. She usually writes for kids and for teens. And when I first heard the premise, woman turning into dragons, that sounds super cool. It's not in a fantasy setting. It's actually set in sort of like a, the 50s in the real world, which makes it even more intriguing um, when it is not sort of like a fantasy per se. And so I was ready for a lot of things to be burned down, literally and metaphorically. And I was looking for a very angry, kind of ragey book, and I was all ready for that. But I didn't get that. Instead, it was more a coming-of-age story. I was about a girl dealing with a lot of growing up stuff, particularly trying to figure out her fascination and her attraction to other girls that she doesn't quite understand and she doesn't really have a name for it yet. But on top of all of that, she's also saddled with a lot of responsibilities that a teenager really shouldn't have. She basically ended up being a mother to Beatrice due to circumstances and horrible adults. The story wasn't what I was expecting because even in the blurb, it said it's like fierce, it's subversive, it's ferocious, and all these really like strong, powerful words. And I was expecting something quite different from what I got. It's okay. I mean, I misunderstood what the book was about, and that's fine. But this whole dragon business was was very strange because in the beginning, it just almost seems like it, they talk about it and then it sort of disappeared, right? We get every chapter begins with some sort of research paper or some sort of speech that was made by some scientists about dragoning, but that's it. Like, we don't really get a lot of dragons. So it's something like, okay, fine. It's going to be a story about a character because of this dragoning thing that their life turns upside down. Fine, I can deal with that. But... The story and especially the messaging was just so hit you over the head and was so repetitive. Like it wasn't like I wasn't sympathetic to Alex. I know I like, you know, life sucks for her. Society sucks. Life of woman sucks. I'm not disputing any of that. But just this descriptions and the dialogue of the things that people say to try to show how sexist the world is it just feels so out dated in some ways and this feels so obvious and cliche that it just like feel like you don't really have to say it I, we, we get it I think at this point and so the book just doesn't feel like a book that should be written a couple of years ago it just doesn't feel like that even though it's supposed to be like a very feminist book I think the lack of representation doesn't help and so like the ideas and everything just seems old and it just feels the book move really really slowly but what really doesn't work for me is that, okay, fine. Dragoning happens. They disappeared. Now Alex is stuck. Okay, okay, that's fine. But then the dragons came back. 
kind of near the end of the book. It changes the tone of the book quite a bit. At first, they were just like perching on the rooftops. They were like flying past your windows. Okay, fine, whatever. You know that something is up or whatever reason they're back. You're intrigued, okay. But then they start trying to get back with the families. They start trying to go to school. And then as one reviewer points out, why do they wear aprons? <laughs> and why are they carrying purses? And they talk a lot about them putting up on lipsticks and like they knit a lot. Like, what is that about? And then they start talking. I'm like, okay, no, like, you know, the whole thing just turns way too cartoonish for me. And it just doesn't work. And then because of these dragons came back, now there's this change that you knew was going to happen. You're expecting it all along. That's going to happen to Alex. It's going to happen to Beatrice. And it would be fine if it is sort of a gradual, like, you know, because you have like hundreds of pages that really nothing much happened. You can gradually build this up. But no, it's just this sudden change of heart. And then suddenly this thing happens and it's just not convincing. So I find it like just a strange book that like just the tone changes and everything is just very weird. And so it just didn't work for me. I think if you're looking for another story about like a transformation due to like how sucky the world is, I would highly, highly recommend Night Bitch by Rachel Yalda. It is so much better, like in a very subtle but really gradual, menacing way, the change is happening that leads to this like really, really glorious ending. It is just so much more impactful. But this is a very well-loved book. There's lots of positive reviews. It was being chosen as the best books of the year by many, many sources. So, you know, maybe it's just me. <laughs> it's probably just me. So don't let my opinions deter you from reading this book. If that sounds like something that you would enjoy about women turning to dragon, about coming of age and all of that. Um, so again, this is When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnfield. Why do they have aprons? I don't know. Why? I don't know. It's like they, they're they like housewife, 1950s housewife dragons. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it was just very weird. It's just like they act very stereotypical. Like it just so that that just didn't work for me. I'm like, you dragons, you know, like <laughs> go burn something down. Like don't like, I don't know, sit there and knit. Like it's just it's just weird. Yeah, but I may have just completely misinterpreted the book and missed the point. Anyway, Sadie, save us from that, <laughs> that not so good dragon book into something better, please. Okay. So as I said, when we first picked this topic, I, I actually wasn't too worried because I'm like, you know what? I, I probably have so many dragon books. I read fantasy. Dragons are in fantasy. So there must be at least one or two that I have read that I can talk about. Nope, not one, not a single one, unless you count Game of Thrones, which I didn't really want to count Game of Thrones. It doesn't need any more promotion. I wasn't going to talk about it. So this led me on a search for a new dragon book, and I did find one that was published this year in January. This is the first book of a new fantasy series by Sarah A. Parker, and this is called When the Moon Hatched. So the world started with five. Kalos, the god of the ether. Boulder, the god of earth. Rain, the goddess of water. Clode, the goddess of air. And Ignos, the god of fire. The mortals who came after learned to listen to the gods and speak their language, an ability that allowed them to wield powers, wield magic. Some very special mortals could hear maybe two gods and some extremely rare ones could hear four. And then, of course, there were the dragons. The fiery saber scythes, the colorful molten moths, and the ice-cold moon plumes. Beautiful and dangerous beasts. Those brave, or perhaps stupid enough to try, would sneak into the nests of the dragons to seal their eggs, tame the hatchlings, and keep them for their own. And those same mortals those who made it back with their dragon egg, also honed their dragon's abilities to use for war, to spill mortal, fey, and even dragon blood. Now, the entire world was surprised when the slain dragons, instead of lying down where they were struck, rose instead up into the sky, curling around themselves and solidifying into moons, into tombstones. They were even more surprised when the same moons began to plummet from the sky 
crashing back into the earth and causing immense damage and disaster. When the gods realized that it was one of their own, Kalis, who was responsible, they bound and split his essence, trapping it in a ruined crystal known as the Ether Stone, set into a mighty diadem. This they gifted to a powerful fey warrior, one strong enough to control the power and keep Kalis contained, passed down the warrior's familial line for millennia. Our story begins with Rave. Rave is known as the Eldin Blade. She's an assassin for the Fear Duath, a rebellion group that works against the King of the Fade, Kadok Vagor. Her job is simple, kill and don't get caught. She's very good at it. And she takes a perverse sort of pleasure in killing the scum of the world. And she relishes this pleasure as there's not much in her life to really feel pleasure about. Maybe her young charge, Essie, who, though Rave will never admit it, she does care deeply for. However, Rave has lost too much in her life to get attached to anything or anyone. So even Essie, she keeps in distance and prefers instead to keep all of her feelings and hurt locked up inside her in a deep, dark lake. But when the king's most ruthless bounty hunter, Rexaros, is put on the trail of the Fear Duath, and Rave in particular, her life is turned upside down. And when she loses the only important thing in her life, Rave refuses to stay in the shadows anymore, vowing instead to hunt down Rexaros and get her revenge. This is how Rave ends up in prison. A filthy prison cell with scorching whip marks down her spine, so deep that they've hit bone, with very little memory of how she got there, but a distinct feeling that she's been chewing on something meaty. Because living inside of Rave is a creature, an other, one that Rave can allow to take over her body, one that wields an immense amount of power and can kill 50 of the king's guards without blinking an eye and bite off the tip of Rexaros's finger before it is put down. But the creature is gone now, retreated back inside Rave, and Rave is left empty and drained and ruined, hardly able to move from the wounds down her back, and in prison, awaiting a trial that will most definitely result in her death. Whether this death will be burning or hanging or Rave's least favorite option, being tied to a post and served up as dragon lunch, is still to be determined. But Rave expects she will die a horrible death that matched her equally horrible life. What Rave doesn't expect is the tall, dark stranger who comes into the prison, removes her from her cell, and brings her to a healer to heal her back. Nor does she expect this stranger to reveal that he is in fact Khan Vagor, king of the burn and brother to the king of the fade. Why he is helping her when she's doomed to die, Rave doesn't know. And when, during her trial, Khan votes to give her death by dragon lunch, Rave is even more confused and furious. Pissed and scared, Rave goes to face her execution, however, with her head high and her tongue sharp, as always. And when the biggest saber scythe dragon she has ever seen comes swooping in and snaps down on the post that Rave is tied to, she knows once and for all that her life is over. This is a big book. It is over 700 pages. It has some pretty intense world building and magical systems and history built into it. I don't know if I just wasn't paying attention when I first started listening to it, but I found the beginning very confusing, a little bit hard to get into. I actually listened to the beginning again yesterday, and it made a lot more sense. So I think maybe I just was not paying attention the first time. The book is split into different perspectives. We see Khan, we see his sister Vea, we see the other that lives inside Rave, but mostly we see the story from Rave's point of view. And it is interspersed with diary entries of an Elowen Navon, who is a young girl uh, who starts writing at eight years old and outlines kind of her day-to-day -day life as the daughter of a noble. Um, and this includes her and her brother's journey to steal a moon plume egg and tame the dragons. As Elowen's diary continues, we see more kind of how it's connected to our main storyline and what happens to Elowen as her life goes on and how that kind of impacts everything else. 
Rave is one of those sarcastic, blunt, mouthy protagonists that I really, really like. You might sense a theme in my reading taste. I actually quite enjoy reading about assassins. I don't know why, (laughs) but you'll notice that a lot of the protagonists that I'm drawn to are kind of these mouthy, sarcastic assassins. But there is also, as you probably guessed, a lot more to her character than first meets the eye. And it's clear that her mouthy, closed-off persona is actually hiding quite a lot of pain and hurt. And as the story goes on, you kind of learn more about this and you learn more about how Rave got to where she is in her life and kind of what what led her there. The book has a bit of a strange, not an enjoyable, but a little bit unbelievable twist to it. I'm proud to say I guessed the twist quite early on. I was quite proud of myself. But it didn't, I don't think the unbelievability of it actually impacted me liking the book. And I honestly, I really did enjoy this book. I think that it's the start of a pretty exciting fantasy series. I don't know how many books are planned in it at the moment. The second book does not currently have a release date or even an entry on Goodreads, but it does say that it is book one of a series. So I'm hoping that there will be more information about book two and further, especially because they did leave it on a bit of a cliffhanger. So it would be nice to to kind of see how it all gets wrapped up. The book does have some romance in it. However, again, one that's a little bit strange, but it's enjoyable nonetheless to read about. It does get quite graphic, both with violence and with sex. So if you are sensitive to those things, just be aware. It does contain dragons. It definitely has dragons in it. It is definitely... Well, I wouldn't say it's about dragons, but they are there. They are present. They are very, very much in the story and a focus of part of the story. So I think it is enough dragon to fit the theme for sure. Um, I, I really enjoyed kind of the characters. I really enjoy Rafe and Khan. They're kind of their banter back and forth. I liked a lot of the side characters as well. Khan's sister, Vea, is really good. It has a lot of kind of really horrible characters that you're supposed to hate, but also some really great, strong characters as well. So I'm very excited about book two. As I said, I have no idea when it's going to come out. And I think this one might definitely be going on at this point on my top, top for this year so far. So it just slipped in with a January uh, release date. So yes, (laughs) I would say that if you enjoy kind of high fantasy, if you enjoy dragons, with a dose of kind of romance, bit of tragedy, bit of revenge, then I think this is definitely the book for you. I would say if it's you start it and you're not super into it, keep going because it does definitely pull you in. And I think that if you are paying closer attention like I was not, then it probably makes a lot more sense and um, you'll get into it a lot quicker. So yeah, that is When the Moon Hatched by Sarah A. Parker. So it's interesting because you said in the beginning, you don't really like dragons. And I don't think you, you also said you don't really like fae, books about fae. I think I'm lying to myself. I do. I think, well, for me, I feel like regardless of the subject matter, regardless of the things, I think that if the, for me, if the characters are strong and the plot is good, I can get into kind of any, any book. This one was interesting with the Fae, though. And, and again, I, I don't know if I just missed this part of the story when I first listened to it. I didn't realize that they were Fae. And it just like every now and then it would mention like, did they say that they were Fae? Did they talk about the fact that they were Fae? But they do talk about how there's some of them that have been alive for over 100 years. So that would make more sense with them being Fae. <laughs> but it could also just be a side effect of hearing the gods and wielding their magic. And so, yeah, that the, the Fae aspect of this book is not super super strong in the in the way that a lot of other books that surround the fae are like it's just some of the characters are fae and it gives them long life and i think that's pretty much the only aspect of fae that is in there so that was easier to to handle but yeah i know i i feel like i have this list of things i don't like this i don't like this but if it's a good story if it's fun characters then i i will usually enjoy it definitely assassin Definitely assassins. That's something I know that comes up, like you said, quite a bit. (laughs) Should be a little concern, I think. It's like Corrine and her poison, and then you and assassins. We're just trying to figure out how we're going to live in the post-apocalyptic world. Corrine is going to have to work on her poisons and poison everyone, and I will just go around and kill people in silence. And that's how we'll rise to the top. Excellent. All right. Great tips. All right. Well, we're going to end our show today with an existential question. 
I'd love to know, are there mythological like creatures or beings that you would like to see more in books? I feel like the ones that I quite enjoy reading about are are quite well represented. I, I it's similar to to Al's taste. I do do enjoy a good vampire story, and uh, just trying to think of some other ones that maybe more krakens, but like krakens that have like personality. Because I feel like if a kraken is in, involved in a book, it's it's just seen as a monster that's attacking. Whereas you don't often see things from the kraken's point of view. So I would read a good kraken story. That's that's interesting. Yeah, because you're right. Like they're usually just like they're not they're not anthropomorphic. They're just there, right? So you want to see anthropomorphic krakens. Okay, <laughs> we can work on that, everyone. If the first one that came to mind was uh, Sasquatch, only because I just want stories about Quachi, you know, so that's the, you know, Vancouver 2010 mascot. I don't really care for Sasquatch. I just care for Quachi. So if you can just put Quachi in books, then I'm I'm good. But the other one that I kind of thought about was this weird, like, and I have a picture of it because I don't think it's like a common thing, but it's like this Japanese, like, yokai. And it's like a, it's like an umbrella. <laughs> It's called Casa Obake. So it's like an umbrella monster. And I first saw it in one of the manga. Um, and so it's always been fascinating me as, as, a, as a kid, like watching that. I don't even know what it does, but I just think like, and it's supposed to be like, just like objects, like that when they get old, they turn into like weird, like monsters, yoga. And so, so I, I really, I don't know. There's something about that particular one always fascinates me. So I just want like some umbrella ghost story. I think that there's a lot of, I, I don't know all of them, but I've read a few books that kind of have the the Japanese yokai in them. And I think that there's a lot to explore there. I think that there's a lot that could be put into to more books with them. Yeah, definitely. Like, because I think like they just like, it's always interesting to see the different kind of different mythology in, from different parts of the world that we're not familiar with. And there's always like interesting, like how they became that and sort of the sort of the origin story and all that. And plus, like, I think like people lose some umbrell umbrellas, right? So where do they all go? I'm assuming they turn into that. So that's what I like to think. Anyway, um, all right. Well, thank you for joining me on this dragon episode. Turns out to be two people who do not care for dragons at all, but we did it. We read a dragon book. We made some sacrifices for this show. And uh, we'll see what happened. What is next week? Oh, I think it's, is it the TikTok next week? I'm on vacation. <gasps> what? <laughs> No! How did you escape that one? Bloop. Yeah, no. You can you can you can already tell my feelings about that episode. So yeah. See, like I was thinking, like, I haven't read my book yet. I have some ideas. I was either gonna go with something that like is definitely like a cheat, or I'm gonna go read a Colleen Hoover. I think that's my two choices. <laughs> right? Either I go all out. Or I do the other thing, which is cheating. Um, so yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Okay. Well, I guess you have to listen to the episode and find out. Do you, do you think all three of you will read a Colleen Hoover though? Oh, no, I don't think oh, so. Okay. okay. Yeah, I feel like, no, I don't know. Because I mean, like, Corinne likes romance. I don't know if she's ever read a Colleen Hoover. And I don't think that's Emma's, mm, yeah. Okay, well, we'll find out. Maybe I can convince them we'll all read a Colleen Hoover book. If we're going to all suffer, or if I have to suffer, then they all should suffer. Anyway, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Stay tuned for our next week TikTok episode with Dal Sadie. Boo! You're not booing at all. All right, well, happy reading, and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Mm -hmm.